Welcome back everyone. I'm thrilled you're with us on 33 Founders today because I'm here with TJ Parker, the co-founder and CEO of PillPack. Thanks so much for being with me, TJ. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So every time I watch the PillPack video or I read about PillPack and see it in action, I'm just so taken back with how simple your product is. From sign up to delivery, can you walk us through the PillPack experience? Sure. So PillPack is a full service pharmacy. So we make it really easy for folks that have to manage medications on a regular basis. Uh, so when you switch to PillPack, you're switching from going to a CVS or Walgreens or wherever you're, wherever you're filling your prescriptions today to PillPack. And we worked really hard to make that sign up flow really simple and fast. And so effectively, it feels like any other e commerce sign up where you fill in your name, your date of birth, your address, things like that. And at the end of the sign-up flow, it presents you with all the prescriptions that you're filling today, no matter what pharmacy you're currently using. Uh, so we cobble together the data to do that to make it really easy. The customer then just selects the prescriptions that they want to switch to back. And we go ahead and transfer those prescriptions from whatever pharmacy they're using today uh, and set up their account, automatically sort their meds into whatever time of day they take them. Uh, and the customer gets a box on their doorstep every two weeks. And rather than it being seven or eight different bottles that they have to sort and organize, it comes pre-sorted into individual dose packs based on when they take them throughout the day. So you have five medications at 8 a.m., three medications at lunchtime, and, and one at, at, at bedtime. Uh, that includes your prescriptions, any vitamins or over-the-counter medications you take. Uh, and then we have really easy-to-use web and mobile tools to manage everything online. Uh, so you can chat with our pharmacists, you can uh, email our pharmacists, uh, and then we actually manage your refills for you so you're not constantly calling your doctors making sure that you didn't run out. And we coordinate with your insurance company to make sure that everything can get filled and shipped to you on the same day. Uh, so we're really trying to take what right now is a super frustrating and complicated experience and make it really simple and easy. Yeah, I think ease is always, and a couple of the reviews that I've read, people just they can't even believe it. Yeah, I think part of it is everyone assumes that sign up and the process of switching is going to be so complicated and frustrating because they're used to such a sort of uh, arduous process to begin with. And so for us, it's like, how do we communicate this is actually really simple? And when they get the first pill pack, people are sort of shocked that it actually all worked. DJ, this is a family business for you. Your dad ran a pharmacy when you were growing up and you always worked alongside him as his assistant. What would assistant TJ think of CEO TJ now? Uh, I think assistant TJ would be a little bit surprised that I actually like got my act together and started pill pack. <laughs> I think 17-year-old uh, TJ was really focused on skiing and having a good time, and uh, I was working in the pharmacy behind the counter and delivering people's meds to their home, but I think it's really, uh, for me personally, pretty amazing you know, how far we've gotten in the last few years, and uh, for this to all have happened so fast is, is super exciting. Something that my friend Arian Radvin had said, he's over at Coach Up, so also in Boston with you guys, is... Like any overnight success, it took us years and years to get here. So from yeah. the outside, it seems like Pill Pack just has this beautiful storybook tale that everything worked out great. But going back to the early days, what was it like? What were the challenges that you faced? Yeah, so I think there was a long sort of lead lead up to Pill Pack being even Pill Pack. I mean, we I was in pharmacy school for six years, and through that time, was exploring how you start a company, how do you build software, how do you design great experiences. Um, and the entire time I was in school, my dad had actually started a new pharmacy that had pre-sorted in packaged meds, but for nursing homes. And so we'd watch that grow from nothing to a sizable business. And so by the time we started PillPack, we, we had a good handle on what we were doing. Um, but even then, there are things that you run into that you just didn't anticipate. Um, for us, probably the biggest one was that we got to a place where we launched in February of 2014, so about a year and a half ago. Uh, we were licensed in 30 or so states, and we could literally ship people their medications, but we couldn't use AdWords or Facebook or any other online channels to market to them. Uh, so that took us about nine months to get the accreditations needed to do that. Uh, and so that sort of everything was working as expected, except for that we couldn't advertise to consumers, which is when your consumer business is a little bit of a challenge. Um, but now I think we're, we're in a place where all, we're sort of firing at all cylinders and, and we're just trying to, to sort of keep the wheels on as we grow really fast. One of the ways you guys are doing that is with your mobile app. Can you introduce us to that and definitely talk about the watch because I'm super excited about that. Sure. So one of the innovations about the mobile app is we actually designed it to work for not just our customers but for anyone that's taking medications. Uh, and so we think it is you know, one of the best versions of a medication reminder app. Uh, so it's very simple in its functionality. We tried, we purposely made it very sort of simple in what it does. Um, but the the first problem we were trying to solve with that app was the onboarding experience of setting up one of these reminders. 
Uh, and so today, traditionally, you have to literally manually enter all this information into the app. And for us, we had cobbled together this data initially for the PillPack.com sign up, but it actually automatically finds your prescriptions at the beginning, so you don't have to manually enter them. Your med list just populates once you've filled out the handful of fields required. Uh, and then you can sort them into packs by time of day and then set up much more sort of flexible reminders that aren't just about time of day, but can be triggered by things like your location. So it can remind you to take your weekday morning meds when you're leaving the house in the morning or take your afternoon meds on the weekend when you get to the beach house. So whatever the trigger that you want to set up is. Uh, and then it also works on Apple Watch, which we're really excited about, especially as you look forward in the future. We built the framework for the reminders in such a way that the triggers can be basically anything and you can set up however you want. And so you know, I think activity gets really interesting and then probably even more interesting is biometric data and how can we use that intelligently in the future. And so I think we're a little ways away from that, but I do think once you get beyond just heart rate and activity and you get to things like glucose or blood pressure, what we can do with that coupled with your medication information gets really interesting. And you guys have filled over a million prescriptions, right? Uh, we've created over a million dose packs, so these individual packs that people take. Oh my gosh, wow. And every time I think of the pack, I just think of that little blue box. And I want to get yeah. a little blue box to just put my one pill in so I, can, <laughs> so I can just have it on the counter. From when you think of the design aspect, I really enjoyed learning about how much design means to you and how much it's played a role in pill pack because you would never think pharmacy and design. How do you approach design as a founder? For me, sep I, so during school, got what at least felt like very separately interested in design. Uh, so Mass Art was right across the street from Mass College of Pharmacy, and we had a relationship such that I could actually cross-register there and take classes in design. Uh, and for me, it was really just something I was interested in. It never felt like much more than that. Um, learned about the history of architecture and furniture design and clothing design. It was really just the things that I was doing when I was bored on the internet, basically. And the more and more I thought about it, it really became clear that pharmacy and the current experience was really a service design problem. It was had never been thought about in the way that the consumer has to experience that. And so if you're a traditional consumer in today's retail pharmacy, you have to go there three times a month because they can't even sync up your fills to the same day of the month. When you're there, it's not a particularly great retail experience. Then you get home and you've got to sort all this stuff yourself. You've got to call your doctors constantly. And we wanted to throw that all away and replace it with something that just worked the way that you would hope it would work as a consumer. And at the end of the day, that is design. It's, like, it's thinking about what this feels like as a user and how to make that that process better. And so, of course, we work really hard to make the site beautiful and easy to navigate and easy to understand. But it's also what are all those touch points that aren't just about the aesthetics? How do those feel as a customer? And I think you get bought into that because of the aesthetics, but we have to deliver on that experience on an ongoing basis. And I think aesthetics are important because one of the things we have to do is, is really derive trust from folks to get them to switch their prescriptions to PillPack. And design is a really great way to do that. But how do we actually improve each one of these touch points such that it really represents who we want to be as, as an entity? When it came to approaching that problem, what have you learned over the past two years about focus? Uh, you know, I think focus is incredibly important, especially in healthcare. I think it's very easy in healthcare to get distracted or to get pulled into things like sort of B2B partnerships or doing clinical research or other things that, depending on your business, may be really, really important. But for us, it was all about this consumer experience. It's, it was everything about the business, and that was what we think the value is in the long term. And so we purposely chose to focus only on that. So we don't, we haven't to date done something like a clinical trial to prove that we improve adherence. It's really been about how do we just make this experience great for the customer because we think that will have an impact in the long term. And, you know, I think it's very, very easy to get distracted, especially in healthcare, and you have to focus on what you think is the most impactful thing you can do. And for us, that was experience design. When it comes to your role as a founder, TJ, what is a misconception about startups and the life of a founder and CEO that prove to not be right for you? Uh, I think there's a misconception that you get to do fun stuff all, every day, all day. I think I do a lot of amazing things that are really fun, and there's a lot of times that I'm at least for a long time, was, was approving invoices and running payroll and all the sort of the things you have to do to keep, keep a company sort of moving forward. Um, and I think there's, uh, that's, that is probably the biggest one. I mean, I think I am super fortunate. We've been in a place where we've been able to hire great people. We've been able to raise money. We've been able to, to sort of see our vision through very quickly. Um, but I do think all that is really the, is the, you know, the result of focusing on things that aren't as fun all the time. Um, and then that enables you to get to do fun stuff. So I think 
that's probably the biggest misconception. So it's not just super fun bringing your safety not, guard to work? <laughs> uh, it's a Bernie's Mountain Dog, but it's not just super fun. She's, uh, I can't bring her here because she's too excitable at this point. Um, <laughs> but someday when she chills out, she'll be able to come to work with me. <laughs> so you mentioned, you mentioned fundraising, and you guys just announced a $50 million Series C last month. And that was only about six months after you announced your Series B, I think which was in October, right? Yep. What was the fundraising process like, especially when it was so fast? Yeah, I think for us, you know, for a little bit of context, we started the company about two and a half years ago. Uh, so this was early 2013. Uh, we then launched in early 2014. And really between when we launched and when we raised the $9 million, it was about proving that we could deliver an experience that people love, building the infrastructure to do that, which was getting licensed and accredited and all of those things. And we really had product market fit. People loved it. But we hadn't really sussed out how do you acquire customers at scale by the time we raised that, that $9 million round. And the accreditations came through in the fall of 2014. We got channels turned on by Christmas time or so. And at that point, it was just very clear immediately that those channels were converting and they were working. And it Merry enabled Christmas. us. Yeah, thank you. Merry <laughs> Christmas, exactly. It enabled us to go back out and we had all of the components to, to scale the business. The product market fit was there. We could acquire customers at a cost that made sense for us. And it was really just about how do we scale this thing really quickly. And so, you know, it really made for a relatively straightforward fundraising process and enabled us to get back to work and, and really try to scale this thing. So, compared to raising your seed round, how are you a different CEO when you were closing in on the Series C? Uh, I think I've learned more and more to replace myself with a lot of the things that I was doing at that point. So it's about how to, I think a lot of it is about hiring great talent that is way better at their job than you ever were at doing the things that, that they are now doing. Um, and I think it's having a much broader vision of how you how you scale and what does this business look like in, in five to ten years. I think we had a really big vision out of the gate and that was always something that enabled us to, to be successful in fundraising and hiring and things like that. But then we could get you to know, drill that vision down into actual sort of actionable items and, and you know what does that look like over the next two years? How do we get to here in five years? And so a lot of that's probably the biggest thing. I think I'm still uh, relatively the same person. I don't think I've changed a whole lot since we raised the seed round. <laughs> and I hope that, that that stays the stays the case over time. When it came to hiring and giving up those roles that you used to play, especially when you were wearing so many hats. How did you give them up? Because sometimes it's hard. You cling on to things. Yeah, and I, there's still certain things that I that I really cling on to. You know, I'm still very involved in in design. I'm very involved in copywriting and approving all that stuff before it ever sees the light of day. Um, but a lot of it was feeling like we could be moving faster and people exist that could do this job better. And I think once I figured that out, it was really helpful as we started to to do hire lots and lots of people. It was, it was really empowering because I could sort of release those things to a place where they were getting done better than they were ever getting done when I was, when I was doing them myself. When it comes to hiring, I know that's something that you guys are focused on. As you shared with your Series C, how do you know that a person that you're interviewing or that you've been referred to is going to be part of the Pill Pack tribe? I think a lot of it is getting bought into what we're trying to accomplish. And so if, if you're not sort of bought into the vision of PillPack and why it's so important and why it needs to exist in the world, I think it's really hard to rally around things that end up becoming hard over time or you, know, you have to stay up all night to launch something or you know, there's, there's work that is less glamorous that needs to get done. I think all those things get better if you're bought into why you're doing it. And so we work really hard to make sure that, that folks that we hire really are on, you know, are on the same page about why we do what we do every day. What's your favorite interview question? Uh, I really switch it up all the time. I don't have a very consistent one. Yeah, it's sort of sussing out. You know, a lot of times, especially when we're hiring product roles, I'm not the right guy to to sort of suss out people's technical chops. I'm a pharmacist, not a developer. Um, so I'm really trying to get to know folks and understand if they're enjoyable to work with and uh, fun to be around and work hard. And so it really depends on the personality. I know one of the things that's super important to you guys is having just amazing customer service reps. So when I call in and especially maybe for someone who's older, switching to an online pharmacy is probably just like, oh my God, how could this be? Yep. What do you look for in those individuals in particular? Uh, it's really about sort of uh, an enormous amount of patience and, and being really sort of friendly and, and communicable. And I think uh, for us, some of those things we're still trying to figure out exactly how you that team. Um, but to date, it's really been about sort of hiring people that we think uh, really understand why we do what we do and, and super personable and, and have some level of experience. Uh, it can, not necessarily in customer service, but customer facing things in the past has been really helpful. We also, 
you know, we don't often look for folks that worked in pharmacy for those roles. We're looking at folks that worked in hospitality or other industries that provide a great level of service. I think pharmacies historically don't. And so uh, it's helpful to find people that don't have the baggage that came from a pharmacy specifically in that role. So once someone is working there, what do you want it to mean if I say, I'm Jenna Abdu and I work at PillPack? Say, explain that a little bit more. What do you want it to mean to work at PillPack? What does the culture feel like? Uh, I think it feels like a place where we we get to work on interesting stuff that makes people's real people's lives better. And I think it's very easy to get caught up in working on things that don't actually add a lot of value to everyday folks. And so for us, I think that's what keeps people excited. It is the sort of the customer stories that we hear over you know over Slack during the day of this person uh, was super excited when they got their first pill pack or someone that you know now can stay at home longer because they have a pill pack. And I think those are the things that keep us hap- that keep us motivated at work. And, you know, I think we don't, we don't hire for culture fit in the sense that we're looking for people that are just like us or that have the same exact uh, outlook on life as us. We look for people that have different outlooks on life because our customers are all very different. Uh, we have customers that live in New York and we have customers that live in Oklahoma or not Oklahoma yet because we're not licensed there, but they live like in the, in the sort of Midwest and we want people that can relate to all sorts of different types of people and mentalities when they're building products or servicing customers. You brought up Slack, which reminds me of a tweet you sent, I think, the other day. That <laughs> it really got me thinking. You said that Slack makes it acceptable to essentially text someone at any hour of the day. And I, I thought about that because I'll Slack someone at... Oh, Slack has now become a verb. Okay. I'll, I'll send yeah, someone, they've done it. I'll, I'll, succeeded. Send, I'll send someone a Slack <laughs> message at 5 a.m. at midnight and think nothing of it as, like, crossing a boundary. How yep. do you maintain boundaries between work and life for your team and make sure that they do have a life outside of PillPack? Yeah, I mean, we we don't have the type of culture that we expect you to be working all night or to come in on the weekend. Like, it just doesn't, it, it was never part of the, the conversation, right? We, we respect people's personal life and the fact that we all have other things to do other than just PillPack. Um, you know, I think I joke sometimes that I'm going to write a book called Managing via SMS, which is like <laughs> I have most of my important conversations on iMessage. You know, I think there's something about our generation of folks that really like are very comfortable communicating on text. And it's why I think Slack is basically just elongating that into more and more of your relationships at work. Uh, but we, we do work hard to we think people are the most productive when they do have time. They're not spending, you know, at work. And people work very differently. So some folks can be super productive for seven hours and then they're shut off for the day. And some people need to intersperse their work with Reddit and everything, everything else and work later. And we're really flexible about what, what type of that person that you are. As a leader of the team, what's, when you assume your role as CEO, what do you want your guiding mantra to be about leadership? Uh, I think it's about finding the right people to do the right jobs and then giving them everything they need to succeed. And a lot of times that's really getting out of the way. And, uh, you know, I, that's how I often lead is really just trying to uh, understand what they're working on, be helpful if I can, but not sort of get in the way. I also think, especially as a CEO, it's really important to be, to be very timely with feedback and with, with answers to things. I think you can effectively be the right limiting step for moving forward quickly. And if there's times in my life where I realize that I'm delaying answers and that ends up just slowing everything down. So it is a really interesting balance between being close enough to things to be able to provide guidance and make sure everything's consistent, as well as getting out of the way enough that, that people can really just succeed in their jobs. And it's something that I'm learning for the first time, obviously, and, and trying to get better at. But it really is about empowering people to let it. I love that. So I want to shift gears for a couple of minutes now and talk about your brick and mortar shops. I was so intrigued by the idea that you guys were going to have shops because the initial thing was <laughs> let's let's turn everything upside down. Yep. But you said that there's a lot of interesting things that can happen face to face. What are those things that you guys are envisioning? Yeah, so I think, you know, our primary interactions with our customers will probably forever be online or on your mobile phone. Um, but I do think there's an opportunity, especially for certain types of folks, to be able to interact with the pharmacist in person. I think going through your medications is a very personal thing. And for some of us that are in our 20s, we're very comfortable doing that over email or doing that over chat or over the phone. But some people want that in-person relationship and they want to be able to talk about those things, uh, especially in the early days of becoming a PillPack customer. So I think, and I don't think a current version of retail pharmacy is all that well suited to do that. You're typically in, in the back of what feels like a 7-Eleven. There's no privacy. <laughs> it, it's, it is what it is. Like, there's no privacy. You're supposed to be talking about things that are very, very personal and really important to, to folks. 
And so I think part of the retail opportunity for us is to be able to talk about how we think that relationship should look like, how the, the pharmacist to customer relationship is not about selling you more stuff. It's about helping you take your meds and understand your meds. And I do think there's also some value from a distribution standpoint to having facilities that are closer to large swaths of population so we can get you things faster uh, as we scale. So there's, there's some different components at play, but I think the main value of these retail shops is to be able to have an in-person interaction that is about your, your health and your medication and not about selling you stuff. I think I'm most excited to see what it looks like. Yeah. It'll, it'll probably be well-designed and modern and clean, and, and I think we're still figuring out exactly what the, the shops will look like and exactly where they'll be, um, but you can rest assured that it'll be a very pleasant place to, to have a conversation about your meds. I read that you guys were aiming for the end of the year. Is that right? Yeah, we're looking at having having other facilities open by the end of this year. Yeah. Wow, that's speedy. No, speeding. I say that now. We, you know, I'm gonna. <laughs> so when it comes to that, TJ, what does the pill pill pack playbook look like right now? Uh, for us, really, it is about you know. In the early days of this business, we we had a product and service we knew people really loved. And a lot of it was very sort of manual processes. We, you know, you take the refill chasing as an example. It was us running daily reports, going through every refill we knew we were going to run out in the next month and chasing that from the doctor. Over time, those have become discrete teams with discrete custom tools that we have to build. And so it's really about, you know, operationalizing a lot of the things that we've been doing to date in such a way that it enables the business to scale. And it really is about sort of honing on the, you know, on the exact experience we provide today, but doing it for way more people. And so that's our focus for the next 12 to 18 months. And I think over time, you'll see more and more products like the Reminder app that we think are a reflection of these other things that we're building in the pharmacy. Um, but the, the main playbook is to keep doing what we're doing, but you know, make sure that that experience does scale. All right, last couple questions, and they're about life. Based, <laughs> based on your Instagram, you have amazing taste in food. I want to know the best breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert you've ever had. Best breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert. Uh, you know, I'm a real sucker for bagels for breakfast, and probably actually the best bagels I've ever had are in my hometown in Concord, New Hampshire. And I go skiing a lot of weekends, and every time we drive by, we stop and, and get it's a bagel. Best. It's the best bagel. Uh, there's another place in Boston called Bagel Source. It's pretty good, but it's not quite there. Um, Best lunch. That's a tougher one. Uh, hmm. I don't know. I'm like, I'm a pretty, yeah, I'm going to say like lunch. I'm going to go bagel for breakfast, pizza for lunch, like steak and cheese for dinner. Just be like very American, but I won't do that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like, yeah, I don't have a good answer for lunch. Uh, but so I'm a, I'm a big breakfast person. I'm a big dinner person. Lunch is usually a void. Um, dinner, I had a really amazing dinner, like maybe a month ago food in Boston. Um, it was like six course tasting menu, had amazing foie gras and uh, amazing. Uh, way to do it. it is the way to do it. I actually have become a big fan of tasting menus because you don't have to make any decisions and I hate making decisions. It's one of the reasons I think design is important because hopefully you don't have to make too many. <laughs> um, and so tasting menus are great in that sense. And then dessert. I mean, dessert's the most important one for me. I'm not a big dessert guy. What? Like I, no, I'm, you know, I, I prefer okay. like Carbs and salt and uh, cheese. I guess cheese would be my go-to dessert. I just don't. Uh, sweets are not my thing. No more questions. I'm ending this. It's over. Yeah, <laughs> it, the salt is the consistency in my menu in my uh, my palate. What's one question that you have always wanted to be asked but nobody's ever asked you? And you're hitting me with all the hard questions here. Uh, I don't have any idea. I, I've asked been asked so many questions in the last six months that. Uh, I don't know. That's a good one. There's a, see, I, I, I always know right off the bat that if somebody <laughs> I'm asks me that. I'm going to have to prepare that, these like, non-related questions. I'm so prepared for everything. But, you know. Like, were you ever good at sports? I was horrible at sports. I wasn't very good at sports. Uh, but in I fifth grade. Good at soccer, though. Fifth grade, they called me the bulldog on my basketball team. And I'm never going to forget that. All right, this is the last question. This one's much easier, so <laughs> no like thought-provoking life questions. Yes, so I'm not very good at life. I'm only good at pill pack. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of the question. You know, what advice would you give your 16-year-old self? Because you can't you can't give 16-year-old TJ advice because that is in the past. Yes, but it doesn't exist anymore. What do you want 35-year-old TJ to remember about life right now? Uh, I think I want 35-year-old TJ to remember that 
he's like right now it's it's everything is new and I'm like learning so much and I think I think it gets very easy to look back and to imagine that you had all the answers five years ago like I look companies now like very early founders and I constantly have to remind myself that I had no idea what I was doing three years ago and I think that only gets worse as you get older because you've <laughs> because you've done everything that you're now looking at 22 year olds and trying to help them do and so I think just reminding yourself that you know you're sort of you're trying to figure everything out yourself and so when you're interacting with other 25 year olds helping them figure out things is really important I think for me the folks that helped us through Techstars, the investors that I've had that have have been super active and helpful, the mentors that I have all sort of were super understanding of all of my blind spots and helped me work through them. And I want to be able to do the same thing for folks when, when I'm 35. Okay, that's a pretty good life answer. You, you got that. Better one. than my food answer. <laughs> Much better. I'm going to have to follow up on that one. You're going to have to at least make up a dessert. Yeah, well, I'll make up a dessert. I, yeah, another big dessert guy. This is what it is. So I used to work at an ice cream shop when I was 16. I didn't even like ice cream. So it was, you know. She just stop while you're ahead. No more. <laughs> no more. <laughs> I've had ice cream for breakfast, so I, just, I can't respect yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time today. How can everyone stay up to date with you and really get acquainted with PillPack and how they can make the shift? Uh, I think you know, we'd love to have you follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook. We're very active on both. Um, hopefully, uh, you keep on top of PillPack.com. I think we're we're more excited about the things we're launching upcoming days, and so would love to have folks that are listening to this either sign up or tell their friends or, or become a PillPack customer. Awesome, and download the app. And download the app. That is totally free, and no no commitment required. You can just try it out. Awesome. Thank you so much, TJ. Thank you very much.